Christ, suffering at the hands of Rome, because they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening, and welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name is Tom Fress, guest hosting for Walt, and tonight we'll continue our reading and discussion of the book Romanism and the Reformation from the Standpoint of Prophecy by Henry Grattan Guinness. Uh, we are currently on page 295 in the book. We're talking about the post-Protestant Reformation interpreters. How did the Protestants of just two or three generations before us, how did they interpret the prophecies of Daniel and of John and of Paul? Who did they see as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist? None other than the Pope, just as all Protestant and Bible believers throughout the Christian era, all the way back to apostolic times. We were reading about Reverend E.B. Elliott and Professor Burks, both fellows of Trinity College in Cambridge, equally able to use the microscope and the telescope. In other words, to look microscopically at the, uh, the prophecies and the world's uh, revelation of, of the, the correct interpretation of those prophecies. But also they used the the telescope, and they could see the broader picture. Now, it's just unquestionably the most learned and able work ever written upon the book of Revelation. Now, people always ask me, Tom, recommend a book for me. Recommend a book that I can read that, so I can see this for myself. Here's another one of those books. The author, Henry Grattan Guinness, says, unquestionably the most learned and able work ever written upon the book of Revelation, is Mr. Eliot's Horae Apocalypticae. I'll spell it for you for those who want to write it down and, and research that work for yourselves. It's pronounced Horae Apocalypticae, and it is spelled H-O-R-A-E-A-P-O-C-A-L-Y-P. T-I-C-A-E. Okay, you can refer to the recording in the archives for the spelling again, but it's Horae Apocalyptica. And it said the late Dr. Chandlish of Edinburgh, no mean judge, describes Eliot as, quote, among the most learned, profound, and able expositors of any of the books of Scripture have ever seen have ever had, okay? According to Henry Grattan Guinness and the late Dr. Chandlish of Edinburgh, 
Eliot and his Horae Apocalyptica was the most learned, profound, and able ex- expositor any of the books of Scripture have ever had. If you want an authority on the interpretation of Bible prophecy, an expositor of the Scriptures, consult Horae Apocalyptica. Now, I'll tell you, it's a monument- monumental work. It's 1,800-plus pages. And much of it is in Latin and Greek, and it's some of it's difficult to read, but anyone who attempts that work is bound to reap a whirlwind of benefit. Now, he continues, he says, Eliot's commentary on the, on the apocalypse is to historic interpretation what Butler's analogy or Paley's famous work is to the evidence of Christianity, a solid foundation. It is learned, candid, and conclusive. It assumes nothing without ground. It deals with unquestionable facts, and that too with great fullness. It compares history with prophecy in a more elaborate way at all points than any work which preceded it. In style, it is somewhat involved and overloaded, and its 10,000 references repel the superficial reader. But it will remain a masterpiece of exposition while the study of the pure word of prophecy endures. And what about Professor Burks? He says, Professor Burks of Cambridge, while equal to Eliot as a scholar, and nearly equal to him in painstaking research, was his superior in philosophic grasp and logical ability. He was a comprehensive synthesist, a keen analyst, a convincing reasoner, an elaborate writer. He was accurate, clear-headed, patient in investigation, fair in statement, ripe in judgment. His works are an intellectual feast, as well as full of spiritual instruction. One of his books that, for example, on the earlier versions of Daniel, is worth more than all the futurists have ever written on prophecy put together. His work on the first elements of sacred prophecy is an overwhelming answer to futurism. Dealing with the most learned and masterly works in in exposition and defense of that system which have ever appeared, those by Maitland, Tyso, Berg, and Dr. Todd, without an effort, it shivers them to fragments and scatters them to the winds. It's a pity that this work has long been out of print and that futurism is left to flourish in certain quarters in ignorance of this able demonstration of its error and absurdity. That's right. Futurism is error and absurdity, and its author is the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits. Its sole purpose was to overthrow historicism and thereby overthrow Protestantism. Now, he says, I shall ever esteem it as a great privilege to have known Professor Burks. To him, I communicated the earliest discoveries I made on the astronomic nature of the prophetic times, discoveries afterwards embodied in my work, in my work entitled The Approaching End of the Age, now in its 10th edition. Of my subsequent investigations in the same line, I will say nothing here, save that I have partially published and yet hope more fully to publish the evidence that the whole of revealed chronology, historic, Levitical, and prophetic, is so related to natural chronology or the time order of nature as to form with it a single system, united and harmonious in all its parts. This is an important department of the connection of the natural and the revealed, a connection involving the unity of their authorship. Nature 
and Scripture are not the works of two minds or of many, but of one. They are two testaments, but one book, and as such are the work of the same divine author. And now, in conclusion, we have traced in these last three lectures the antiquity, the practical use, and the systematic development of the historical interpretation of Bible prophecy. The interpretation which regards papal Rome as the Babylon of the Apocalypse and the Roman Pontiff as the man of sin. We have shown that the historical interpretation was the earliest adopted in the Christian Church, that it developed with the course of history, that it sustained the Church through the long central ages of the great apostasy, that it gave birth to the Protestant Reformation, that it has been since confirmed by the events of several centuries and elaborated and defended by an unbroken series of learned and unanswerable works. In vain do they, do, excuse me, in vain do the waves of controversy rage against this stately rock. What is that stately rock once again? Historicism. The revelation of history in prophecy. And where do we go to verify the fulfillment of prophecy but history itself? That is historicism. And history proves without equivocation that there's only one candidate for the Antichrist of the Bible, and it is the papacy. There's not even another candidate. God did not deal treacherously with his own people. History leaves us no wiggle room, no room for debate. Just as surely as we know that Christ is our, our king, we know that Antichrist is the Pope. Now, it has stood for ages and is destined to remain till the light of eternity shall break upon the scene. The historic interpretation is no dream of ignorant enthusiasts. It is no speculation of fanciful, ill-balanced minds. It has grown with the growth of generations. It has been built up by the labors of men of many nations and many ages. It has been embodied in solemn confessions of the Protestant Church. It forms a leading element in the testimony of martyrs and reformers. Like the prophets of old, these holy men bore a double testimony. Listen to what that double testimony is. They, these holy men bore a double testimony, a testimony for the truth of God and a testimony against the apostasy of his professing people. You want to know what it is to be a true child of the living God? You are for the truth of God, and you stand steadfastly against his counterfeit, the papacy. And that's where we get our name. We are protesters against Rome. And if we cease to protest against Rome, we are no longer protestants. Now, the providential position which they occupied, the work that they accomplished, gave singular and special importance to their testimony. And this was their testimony, and nothing less, that papal Rome is the Babylon of prophecy, drunken with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, and that its head, the Roman pontiff, is the predicted man of sin, or the Antichrist. To reject this testimony of God's providential witnesses on a matter of such fundamental import, and to prefer to it the counter-reformation doctrine advocated by the apostate persecuting Church of Rome, 
that is futurism is the error and the guilt of modern futurism. Let me read it again. To reject this double testimony of God's providential witnesses on a matter of such fundamental import and to prefer to it the counter-doctrine advocated by the apostate persecuting Church of Rome is the error and the guilt of modern futurism. And that futurism is self-condemned. Futurism is literalism, and literalism in the interpretation of symbols is a denial of their symbolic character. It is an abuse and a degradation of the prophetic word and a destruction of its influence. It substitutes the imaginary for the real, the grotesque and the monstrous for the sober and the reasonable. It quenches the precious light which guided the saints of ages and kindles a wild, delusive marsh fire in its place. It obscures the wisdom of divine prophecy. It denies the true character of the days in which we live. And while it asserts the nearness of the the advent of Christ in power and glory of his kingdom, it at the same time, destroys the only substantial foundation for the assertion, which is prophetic chronology, and the stage now reaches in the, in the fulfillment of the predictions of the apostasy. But in spite of the injurious effects of these false interpretations, the foundation of God standeth sure. None can cancel the prophecies which he has written in his holy word, and none can deny or destroy the mighty and far-reaching results which their true interpretation has already accomplished in the world. It has given us, and this is its glory, it has given us the Protestant Reformation. It has broken the iron chains of superstition and despotism and lifted nations from the depths of their abasement. It has reared a temple whose walls no enemy can ruin. It has reopened, it has given back to the world that book whose teachings have led millions into the way of life and peace. And the sacred light of these prophecies is still guiding the church of God across the wide ocean of her dangerous way. Those steadfast stars of prophecy, which lighted of old the persecuted Waldenses through the darkness of the Middle Ages, which lighted the progress of the Lollards and the Bohemians before the Protestant Reformation, which lighted the noble reformers through gloom and tempest 300 years ago, and which have since lighted watchful saints through troubled centuries, are shining still in that high and holy firmament, whence no mortal hand can pluck them down. And they shall shine on those thousand glittering stars of prophecy till they have fulfilled their glorious mission, till they have guided the church in safety to her celestial haven, and their long-endured radiance melts at last in the rising splendors of eternal day eloquent words by one of the great authors of the Protestant Reformation, Henry Grattan Guinness. Inspiring words. But before we can be inspired and challenged and enthralled by this wisdom, we have to understand who the Antichrist is. And we also have to understand it is our It is our spiritual duty to return to Bible prophecy, to return to Protestant, the post-Protestant, the pre-Protestant, the historical interpretation of all of God's people throughout the Christian era, throughout the centuries, all the way back to the days of Paul. The papacy is the Antichrist, the little horn of Daniel, the mouth that roars, the deceiver, 
the great killer of the saints of Almighty God. It's none other than the papacy. And until we become, we wrap our brains around that reality and then contemplate what power and strength and authority the papacy has over the governments and thereby over the people of this world, we're defenseless against them. Defenseless against them. The Christian life is a two-plank proposition. Yes, we must be for Christ, but we also must be against his Antichrist. Now, Lecture 8 is entitled, Double Foreview of the Reformation. Was there a, a foreview of the Protestant Reformation? Henry Grattan Guinness says, in our previous lectures, we've considered from the standpoint of prophecy the great papal system of Latin Christianity. And it now remains for us to show you in in this closing one that the same mirror of the future which so fully reflected the coming of Roman apostasy reflects as clearly that Protestant Reformation movement of the 16th century which anticipated from it which anticipated from it myriads of man excuse me which emancipated from it myriads of mankind this could hardly be otherwise as prophecy traces the entire story of roman rule it both in both its pagan and papal forms and carries it on to a point even now future It would not, of course, pass by unnoticed the most remarkable and the most noteworthy incident in the latter section of its history. It could not omit from its anticipative record an episode so distinctly providential as that Protestant exodus, that Protestant exodus, which split split Western Christendom into two halves, and severed from the communion of Rome, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, Holland, and Great Britain. It might, be, it might well be omitted from Daniel's very distant foreview, but scarcely from the latter prophecy of John, when the incipient workings of the apostasy had already commenced. Neither the story of the apostate church nor that of the true, would be complete without it. For it was an episode of stupendous importance to the welfare of hundreds of millions of mankind through nine or ten generations, both to those... Excuse me, both to those whom it liberated from the superstitions and tyrannies of Rome and to those on whom, by a counter-movement, it riveted with fetters more strongly than ever. What? Should the ruin wrought by Romanism be plainly portrayed in advance on the prophetic page, and the revivals uh, produced by the Spirit of God in the world of his mouth, and the word of his mouth be left altogether out of view? Should the work of Satan his corruption and defilement of the professing church be reflected in the divine mirror and not the work of his glorious head and glorious head of the true church through his faithful witnesses in the restoration to the world of the primitive Christianity it had lost? Never. A true mirror reflects everything alike. And scripture prophecy anticipates the entire outline of church history. Just as there are no events in the history of Israel which were not foretold before they came to pass, so in the history of the Protestant church. The Reformation of the 16th century and its glad and glorious results are as clearly foreshadowed and foretold as the Romanism of the Dark Ages. You'll naturally inquire where and how. Before replying, let me remind you that there are two kinds of prophecy in Scripture, the acted and the spoken or the written, the type and the prediction. 
In the Levitical sacrifices, for instance, we have acted prophecies of the atonement. In Isaiah chapter 53, we have verbal predictions of it. The whole history of the, nat- of the natural Israel is typical of that of spiritual Israel, or the Christian church. Both are delivered from Egypt. Did you hear what he said? Both have been delivered from Egypt. Don't, he, he's telling us that the Protestant Reformation was our exodus. The Protestant Reformation that brought us out of the Babylonian or the Roman Catholic or the papal bondage, the Pharaoh of Rome was our exodus. From now on, to understand fully and completely and spiritually what the Protestant Reformation was, It was exactly to us what God's miraculous deliverance of the Israelites from the the bondage of Egyptian Pharaoh. That's how this author equates it, and that's how the best expositors of history and prophecy also interpret the Protestant Reformation. It was our treading with dry-shod feet through the Red Sea. It was... The Protestant Reformation was our Shekinah glory. It was our deliverance, our liberty. Should we then join the ecumenical movement to return to bondage, to Roman bondage? The answer is clear. No, we are to resist. We are not to be like those Israelites who murmured against Moses and wished to return back to the bondage of Pharaoh. We are not to be a part of the ecumenical movement, which is the equivalent of raising controversy against Moses and suggesting that God's delivered people ought to return to bondage. He says the whole history of the natural Israel is typical of that of the spiritual Israel or the Christian church. Both are delivered from Egypt. Both are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Both are led through a desert. Both are sustained by bread from heaven. Both journey toward a rest that remains for the the people of God. This broad analogy descends in a wonderful way to details. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 shows this and states that not only was Israel's history typical, but that it was divinely ordered, that it might be so. In other words, it was intentionally prophetic. Quote, these things, he says, happened unto them for ensamples, in other words, types, and are written for our instruction, unquote. Not only are they recorded for our warning, but they occurred in the providence of God in order that they might foreshadow the experiences of the Christian church and that she might learn from them solemn and needed lessons. The incidents of Jewish history actually happened that they might be types of Christian history and divine foreknowledge is as much exemplified in this correspondence between type and antitype as in that between prediction and fulfillment. I am to show you this evening, then, two sets of predictions of the Reformation, one acted in Jewish history, the other symbolized in apocalyptic prophecy. The one embodied in the story of the Old Testament the other in the symbolic predictions of the new. Before I can do this, you must allow me to remind you with some degree of accuracy what the Reformation was as to its broad historical characteristics. It was not the Reformation of the Church, but 
but but it's reformation, it's reformation. Let me read it again. It was not the formation of the church, but its reformation after its ruin by Romanism. It was not a first beginning, but a second. I don't want the listeners to miss this. Henry Grattan Guinness is telling us that the Protestant Reformation was nothing new. The Protestant Reformation was simply a return to pristine, Bible-believing, apostolic Christianity. And that the great falling away, the great apostasy, the Roman Catholic Church had corrupted it. And Protestantism was God's answer to that Roman corruption, that great falling away. And that's the way we are supposed to see the Protestant Reformation. If it is prophetic, if it is the deliverance of God from the Roman Pharaoh, then it should be viewed as a restoration to true Bible prophecy, or true Bible Christianity, pristine Christianity, apostolic Christianity. Listen to what he says again. Speaking of the Protestant Reformation, he says it was not <clears throat> it was not the formation of the church, but its reformation after its ruin by Romanism. It was not a first beginning, but a second. Pentecost. Sorry about this frog in my throat this evening. He says, Pentecost formed the church. Popery deformed it. Protestantism reformed it. Pentecost occurred in the first century and is associated with the work of the apostles themselves. The Reformation did not occur until the 16th century and was not completed until the 17th and is associated with such names as Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, Cranmer, and Latimer. The first belongs to ancient history, the last to modern times. A great chronological gap of nearly 1,500 years lies between the two. There were the early ages of first love, apostolic zeal, rapid extension, martyr suffering, noble confessions and apologies followed by other centuries of imperial Christianity, growing corruption, of bitter strife and ambitious rivalries, and these again by a thousand years of papal dominion and ever-deepening moral darkness, before the glad light of the Protestant Reformation broke over the earth. It is a late episode of Christian history, not an early one. And further... When it did take place, its results were very partial. It has affected but a portion of the apostate Christendom. It has not brought back to the faith of Jesus Christ Austria, Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, or Belgium, all of which I will add are Roman Catholic nations to this very day. The Reformed nations, the Protestant nations, may be the mightiest, the wealthiest, and the most progressive, but they constitute only a fraction of Roman Christendom. The greater part of it remains involved still in the papal apostasy. Moreover, Protestantism, priceless as have been the benefits it has conferred on those who have joined its ranks, is yet very far from being a perfect recovery from uh, 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 a perfect recovery of primitive Christianity. In other words, Protestantism still has its foibles. There's still some problems with Protestantism. That's what this author is saying, and I concur. I won't elaborate. There's plenty of time for that later. But he continues. He says, "It has risen out of the gross ignorance and the superstition of medieval Romanism." It has altogether abandoned the idolatry of image worship, virgin worship, saint worship, 
and the adoration of the priest-made wafer deity of the Latin Mass. It has recovered a purer faith and a simpler ritual and secured for the church a measure of liberty and independence. Above all, it has circulated the scriptures in the vulgar tongues of the nations of Christendom and has adopted as its motto, the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. But it has never completely purified itself from Romish doctrine and practice. It has never regained complete independence of secular dominion. It has never got clear of union with the world. It has rejected the claim of the church to rule the state. It has not as clearly refused the pretension of the state to rule the church. It has suffered worldly ambition, priestcraft, simony, and abuses of many kinds. And it has developed two strong tendencies, one to return to the Romish apostasy and the other to rationalism and infidelity. The true spiritual church of Jesus Christ is still, even in Protestant lands, but a small part of the professing church. I want you clearly to bear in mind from the outset that uh, then, first, that in point of time, Protestantism is a late or modern movement. Secondly, that it is, in point of sphere, a limited one. And thirdly, that it is, in point of character, a very imperfect return to primitive Christianity. One more introductory remark before I pass on. May we not safely conclude that Protestantism will last till the end of the age and the second advent of Christ? The Reformed churches will never be darkened by a universal apostasy, as was the early church. The innumerable millions of Bibles read and studied all over the world, the countless human minds enlightened by their contents, and human hearts regenerated by their revelation of God in Christ, and linked by faith and love and eternal life to the Savior, forbid the fear that the recovered, that the recovered gospel will ever again be lost to the world. The chronology of the papacy shows us that the coming of the Lord is at hand, and hence we may rest assured that the Protestant Reformation is not only a late incident in church history, but that it is the last great movement. The next will be the final change from the militant to the triumphant condition of the church. When the fourth empire shall pass away, that is, when the Roman empire shall pass away and be succeeded by the kingdom of the Son of Man and of the saints. We have entered on that phase of church history, which will exist at the second advent. Nothing remains unfulfilled of the predictions concerning Romanism except her sudden destruction at the end of this age. As regards the history of the Protestant Reformation, I want you to remember that it took place in stages during a period extending over half a century. Its commencement is reckoned from the year that Martin Luther published his theses against the indulgences of A.D. 1517, and its close in Germany, at least, uh, may be placed in A.D. 1555, when the celebrated Peace of Augsburg confirmed the Protestants of Germany in all their rights and possessions and recognized their complete national and ecclesiastical independence of the Pope. The close of the Anti-Reformation Council of Trent and the full establishment of the Protestant Church of England were in A.D. 1563, 46 years from the initial date of the Protestant Reformation. The struggle to maintain the position gained in face of the murderous papal reaction, which dates from the Council of Trent, occupied a much longer period and was not over even at the Peace of Westphalia at the end of the Thirty Years' Religious War in A.D. 1648, when a basis was laid for the settlement of the long struggle in Central Europe. It extended, however, in France, 
<clears throat> and England still further, nearly up to the close of the 17th century, when it was finally settled in favor of, pay, of popery in France by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes and in favor of Protestantism in England by the Glorious Revolution, which placed William of Orange on the throne and passed the Act of Succession, including Popish monarchs, for the future. Not without so severe, so severe and long continued a struggle did the Reformed religion itself establish itself, even in the countries where it did take root, or Protestantism ceased to resist, even in the countries where it was ultimately crushed. I want to ask my listeners a question before I ever even continue. Yes, Protestantism was crushed in some nations that tried to convert to Protestantism, but failed. I want to ask my listeners, will we stand by silently while Rome crushes out the Protestant Reformation in this country? Will we be like those other nations who struggled to to escape from the clutches of the Roman Pharaoh, but who failed, who grew weary of the struggle, and who succumbed to Jesuit casuistry and sophistry and lies, as does the United States? Shall we allow Protestantism to die in this country and to lose our freedom to the bloody count, the bloody Counter Reformation Council of Trent and its Jesuit hordes. That's a very, very contemplated question. From my point of view and the research that I've done, it appears that once Protestant America has succumbed to Roman tyranny simply because we've failed to remember what Protestantism is and we've ceased to protest the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. He says, as to the various aspects of this great Reformation movement, you must distinguish especially between three. Number one, It was first and mainly, as we have said, a return from gross and long-continued apostasy to primitive Christianity. It was a revival of spiritual religion in the hearts of men. As at the first promulgation of the gospel in Europe, the pagan people, quote, turned from their idols to serve the living God and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, unquote. So, in the 16th century, men turned once more from the idols of papal Rome instead of pagan Rome, which they had worshipped, and they turned to God. They turned from the doctrines of demons to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They began once more to rejoice in the belief that Jesus had delivered them from the wrath to come. They received the doctrines proclaimed by the Protestant Reformers, not as the word of men, but as the word of truth, the word of God. It worked in them effectually, so that they took joyful and spo- uh, they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods and all the other sufferings which came upon them from their enemies and from them, and from them sounded out everywhere the word of the Lord. They received the word in much affliction, but in joy of the Holy Ghost and in power and assurance. The Reformers were like the apostles, holy, self-denying, Bible-loving, hard-working preachers of the gospel. In its first and primary aspect, the Reformation was a spiritual work. Its germ was the work of the Holy Ghost in the soul of Martin Luther, convincing him of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, 
leading him to repentance and to belief of the gospel of God's grace and convincing him that salvation was not of works. It was what we should in these last days call a spiritual revival traceable to the sovereign grace of God in the first place and to the republication of his word in the second. Number two, but the Reformation did more than produce a spiritual revival. As a matter of history, it gave also to the world a new ecclesiastical system. It established Reformed churches in separation from the Church of Rome, national churches with secular monarchs in some cases at their head, and this was the case of England, where Henry VIII made himself head of the church in these lands. Whether this was for evil or for good, we must not here consider, but simply note the fact that the Protestant Reformation movement built up a new outward organization of an ecclesiastical character with new articles and rubrics, new ceremonies and practices, and a new fountainhead of authority. This new organization was not only distinct from, but antagonistic to Romanism, and because of its being so was called Protestant. It has grown with enormous rapidity during the last three centuries and has already attained proportions not, not far short of those of the ancient and apostate church against which it protests. It is characterized by the circulation of the Bible and the reference to it as to a standard of all controversies by the recognition that ministers of Christ should not be sacrificing priests, but gospel preachers, preachers of the word, heralds of the great salvation, and by an acknowledgment of the right of private judgment in the interpretation of Scripture. And number three, lastly, the Reformation produced Protestant kingdoms, nations which severed all ties that bound them to Rome and asserted their own absolute independence of the popes. In a word, the movement was one of renovation and liberation, which spread in successive and ever-widening circles from the individual to the church and from the church to the nation. It was one founded on a recovered Bible, extended by a renewal of the long-discussed practice of preaching, and issuing in the largely improved but still imperfect state of things which we see around us today. It emancipated the minds of men from long and bitter bondage. It gave an impetus to arts and science, to enterprise and to culture, to freedom and liberty. It was naturally hailed as a glad deliverance by all who came under its influence but it brought upon them long struggles and cruel sufferings under the terrible and mighty Roman wild beast. The world reeled under the fierceness of his wrath on the escape of so many of his victims. His thunderous roar rent the air. His mad passion caused the blood of the saints to flow in torrents. His cruel claws dragged thousands into his dens of torture in the dark inquisition dungeons. And so horrible was the sacrifice in human life resulting from his rage that the world turned on him at last and bade him be still, bound, and beat him into silence, drew his claws and his teeth, deprived him of dominion and of power to do further damage, and left him feeble and defenseless, albeit as fierce as ever. Let me just ask you a question. After hearing so eloquent words, do you realize that the Protestant Reformation once nearly destroyed the papacy, once nearly destroyed the Antichrist? That's when the fatal, the, the, the mortal wound was inflicted. The Protestant Reformation. nearly destroyed the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. And how did it do it? By the word of God. No sword had to be drawn. 
the people just walked away from the Roman Catholic Church. They walked away from the priests and the popes of Rome, recognizing them for what they were. That's all it takes to defeat Rome. Marry a drop of blood need be shed. The world just needs to wake up to the reality. And after waking to the reality that the papal system is that man of sin, common sense dictates that they walk away, they kick the dust off their feet, and they never return. And what power does the Pope have if he can't command men and governments and nations? None. But it's going to take more than that because God's people just simply won't accept the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth. They don't want to be called a Roman Catholic bigot. They don't want to answer the call. They want to wait for Christ's return. And it's going to take Christ to destroy this beast. I consider it a shame that we have to wait for Christ to see this beast destroyed when all it would take is just simply walking away. He says, we stated just now that this great Protestant Reformation movement was doubly foretold in the Bible. It is foreshadowed in the typical history of Israel in the Old Testament, and its, and its story forms one act of the prophetic drama of the apocalypse in the New. Number one, it was foreshadowed in the history of Israel. Just as the exodus of Israel from Egypt after the Passover and their crossing of the Red Sea foreshadowed the redemption of the church by the death and resurrection of Christ our Passover, just as the murmurings and rebellions of Israel in the wilderness prefigured the similar incidents in church history, so the idolatries of Israel foreshadowed the idolatry which early crept into the church and which now corrupted it altogether. Even in the desert, Israel fell into idolatry and worshipped the golden calf. And perhaps the most salient feature of their history is the constant tendency to relapse into this degrading iniquity. No sooner were Moses and Joshua and their contemporaries dead and gone than declensions into idolatry became frequent. Various tyrants were allowed to conquer and oppress the people as a chastisement for this sin. And when they cried to God in their trouble, and he sent judges and deliverers, they perhaps served Jehovah as long as the judge lived, but quickly afterwards relapsed again. Six times over, they were given up to their enemies, and the, uh, the united servitudes they endured extended to 111 years. Still, they did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtoreth, and the gods of Syria and Zidon, and the gods of Moab and Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. Judges, chapter 10, verse 6. Hardly has reached the zenith of their national prosperity under David and Solomon, than again there set in a process of declension. Solomon himself built idol temples for his heathen wives. And after the schism between Israel and Judah, idolatry became the state religion among ten tribes who worshipped the golden calves set up by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat at Dan and at Bethel, and adopted besides all the idolatries of the heathen around them. Israel built, as we read in Kings, high places, in all their cities, from the Tower of the Watchmen to the Fence City. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them. 
and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger, for they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 9 through 16. So general did this worship of Baal become in Israel that in the days of Elijah it was all but universal, and there were but 7,000 left who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Jeremiah explained in the Lord's name, Hath a nation changed their gods which are not yet gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me and the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. Isaiah cries, How is it the faithful city become a harlot? They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are all gone away backward. Ezekiel describes the idolatry of Jerusalem and Samaria under the figure of the grossest and most abominable idolatry. Hosea said, Israel hath forgotten his maker and buildeth temples. Hosea chapter 8, verse 14. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Hosea 4, 17. Amos accused Israel, saying, Ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and your Chewan and your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Amos chapter 5, verse 26. Speaking by the mouth of Jeremiah, the great prophet Jeremiah, the Lord of hosts, exhorts his people, Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal? and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 4 through 11. The ancient prophets are full of this subject. As you will remember, expostulations, appeals, threats, irony, indignant remonstrances are all employed in turn, but the people were obdurate. We will not hearken unto thee, they said to Jeremiah. We will certainly burn incense unto the queen of heaven, and pour out drink offerings unto her. Jeremiah, chapter 44, verse 16 and 17. The enormity of this sin was enhanced by the fact that the very object of Israel's existence as a nation was that they might be a holy nation, a peculiar people to Jehovah. They were the sole witnesses in the world to the true God and that they seemed obstinately resolved to sink back to the level of their heathen neighbors. The relapse of Israel and Judah into heathen idol worship was punished in the providence of God by their captivities in the lands of the heathen. Israel was carried captive to Assyria and Judah into Babylon. The heathenism of Jerusalem and Babylon were substantially identical. Each was marked by gross idolatry and accompanied by cruel persecution of all who resisted it. 
Manus he filled Jerusalem with the blood of the faithful whom he slew. In Babylon, however, both idolatry and persecution found their most complete development. Nebuchadnezzar set up his golden image, issued his persecuting edict, and kindled his fiery furnace, and Belshazzar made his impious feast and brought the vessels of God's house to his table, that he might, and his lords, his wives and his concubines, might drink wine in them and praise the gods of gold and silver and brass and iron and wood and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, unquote. And Daniel said, addressing the doomed men, quote, the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified, unquote. Daniel chapter 5, verse 23. I'm going to stop right there. I've run out of time, and I've run out of breath, and I've run out of voice, and I'll just tell you, you want to see the modern-day version of this idolatrous rejection of the Lord of glory, this obstinate rejection of the truth in exchange for fables? You'll find it complete and entire in the ecumenical movement that has now become the orthodox teaching in the churches today. We have reached a pinnacle of apostasy in this country, and there's nary a Protestant voice left. The only thing that remains is our captivity, and it's coming. It's already being applied. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.